Hey, well, welcome to Lab the Podcast. So good to be in the room with a live recording. It's been a while. I said it just a few moments ago, 157 episodes so far in our podcast. And tonight we get to record 158. And we get to do it live in the room with a special guest. And my special guest is an artist. And before I introduce her, here's how I want to set this up. Uh, art is a penultimate thing. If you know that word penultimate, uh, some of you, if you're a track athlete, you know there's a penultimate step. If you have been around the art world, you know that the penultimate things point through something and to something beyond them. They're the classic transcendentals, the good, true, and beautiful things. And so art is one of those things that you can look at it, but really the maybe a helpful way to engage art is to learn to see through it. And that's what I hope tonight's conversation does. And for everybody who joins us downstream, I hope that you go out of here, not just engaging this conversation and a piece of art tonight, but that you'll go back into your home and maybe see through the things that are beautiful in your own environment and not just look at them, but learn to look through them. So my guest tonight is an artist. Artists have this incredible invitation they make us to pay attention. And tonight, before we talk about this piece of art and this artist, we have a conviction at V3 that C.S. Lewis said a long time ago, there's no mere mortal. You've never met one. And so just being in the room together, Ephesians says this about us. It says that we are the poetry of God. Did you know that? That's the way God sees creation is you are his poetry. And so just tonight, we get to look around this room is chock full of life and beauty. And behind this, there's a piece of life and beauty. But again, that beauty just points us to the artist behind it. And so the artist tonight that we get to share some time with is Mary Frances Fleming. I'm going to read your bio because there's some beautiful things I don't want to miss. Mary Frances is passionate about building community, helping others, spreading joy and positivity through art and design. She is an artist, designer, and licensed art educator. She works with local businesses, supporting them through graphic design and brand development, typography, designing, collateral materials, even websites, and doing things like this, commissioning visual works. Uh, Mary Frances' introduction to art began with just a passion for painting and drawing. That took her into a visual arts study at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago that's dear to many of us. Uh, there we, she was taught the importance of not only making art, but also the value of experiencing it, the research behind it, and the critique process that takes place in art. She uses vivid colors, elements of abstraction, and a variety of mediums and materials to create her paintings. Her work has been exhibited in Houston, Chicago, Memphis, and now Tampa. So would you welcome Mary Frances Fleming? Thank you. Thank you, and thank you so much for having me. I'm super excited to share with everyone and talk about my piece. Yeah. Well, thank you for saying yes to it. When she said <laughs> yes, she didn't know that we were going to do the podcast. We slipped that in later. And so, uh, would you be interested in commissioning a painting? She said yes. And we said, oh, by the way, could we unveil it publicly and then talk about it? So thank you for being gracious with us. It's yeah, so absolutely. good to share the time. Um, art unveilings like this, there's an aliveness to it, a little bit of thrill, a little bit of nerves. I got up and said, I think I'm a, I've got a little nerves in me. And I asked Mary Frances, is this normal for an event like this? You've done this in Chicago, Houston, Memphis. What's different about doing something like this in Tampa for you? Um, so most of the previous showings that I've had, it's, it's a little bit of a different format. The art is usually already displayed. This is actually my first ever art unveiling. So I'm excited about that. But usually it's kind of come and go and people look at the art. But I really love this opportunity because it gives me more of a chance to share about my work and the process and just have more of a open conversation about it. Yeah. It's, if you've been engaged in art, you know this, but you, you need the creativity part, but you need the courage too. Uh, Brene Brown wrote her book, Daring Greatly. She said, it's not the critic who counts. It's the one who's out there. It's a, it's a risky thing to do something like this. So you have creativity and you have courage if you look back like childhood years, take us back to the young years, would you have found those elements there? Your parents are here tonight. They might have said yes, but <laughs> were creativity and courage there early on? Were you making art and sharing art back in the young years? 
I was definitely making art. I mean, I thought of it more as a hobby when I was younger, you know, when you're a kid and you're trying different things. Um, I really got into it more so in high school, but I still felt a lot of hesitation with sharing my work, which a lot of young artists feel because you put all this effort in and then you see other people's work and you compare your work. And so it takes time to build that confidence in your abilities and just your your own sense of finding your own style and expression in your work can take time. Uh, but yes, I've always been creating from a young age. Yeah. I wish it, I want a time machine. If we can figure that out, that would be awesome. Because I want to go back to those childhood years and see there's always people and places who shape us. And we don't even know the influence that they're having on our lives. But somebody nudges you or encourages you or gives you the courage to take a risk. Who were some of the people for you on a personal level? Not not maybe at the artistic impact. We'll get to that, especially mm -hmm. at the Art Institute. But personally in those young years who were some of the people in, in places even that shaped you as you look back and you go yeah who I am today I see those influences showing up in me as a person but also in my art yeah absolutely I mean the, my first thought is my parents they've always been super supportive um, and I know not everyone is supportive the, of the artist, you know, lifestyle or going after that. So I'm super grateful for that. Um, and then also I have an uncle who is an artist and an architect. And I saw how he had his own architectural firm and also did his painting and made that work. And that was a huge influence on me as well. Um, and yeah, there were there. I had some amazing art teachers along the way, who really helped shape me. My high school was very involved in the arts and supportive of the arts, and so that's when I really started to get into painting and drawing, and taking every opportunity I got to uh, practice my skills and gain more skills. Um, yeah, and I, I also had a lot of amazing friends and still have a lot of amazing friends who are also artists, so I can bounce ideas off of them, get feedback on my work, and I think that that's so important, too. Yeah, it's awesome. I love the people in our stories who give that encouragement, and I'm going to pull on that thread that of not everybody always pushes towards that as a career or a vocation because there's a lot of risk to it. But in our world right now, we talk about a disenchanted world. If you're familiar with the name Max Weber, a lot of people in the early 1900s were looking ahead. Even Lewis, when he wrote Abolition of Man, was looking ahead to our moment and was saying there's things that are changing. If you've read Abolition of Man, he talks about beauty as being subjective versus objective. And he talks about a waterfall and he says, can we really look at a waterfall and say that's beautiful? And do we have a basis of truth to point to something and say that's beautiful or not? And he was wrestling with those ideas. But a lot of people early 1900s were saying, if we don't continue to have this rigorous conversation and if we don't affirm beauty and if we don't affirm artists as not as an extra thing, but as a fundamental thing. And even the script, Christian scriptures, if you go back to Genesis, it says it was good and pleasing right to the eye. So even the trees, the gardens, it was good and pleasing. There was a beauty to it that wasn't an extra. It was woven into the essential things. And so we don't get to share those essential things if somebody doesn't give their time and their energy to do it. When did you know that your pursuit of art was going to lead into a vocation, into a calling that would be uh, even your work and the way that you would earn a living and live your life and make your way? Was that early childhood? Was it later, like right before college? When did that decision start to become right at the threshold? Um, I would say in high school, I was, there was a point where I was debating, should I go to specifically an art and design school or, you know, a more traditional, well-rounded college? Um, and I chose to go to School of the Art Institute of Chicago, which is specifically an art and design school. And I think that was the best decision for me. And um, it allowed 
it opened up so many doors for me and opportunities that I wouldn't have gotten if I went to, you know, a traditional university. So that is probably the turning point when I made that decision. And I just said, okay, I'm going to go all in on this. It's, uh, I almost want to invite your parents up to have a th- multiple way go. <laughs> I have a 17 year old daughter and you think about that. Your, your child comes home, your young adult comes home and says, I feel a calling. I feel like I'm called and gifted to pursue this thing. And you think about it and you go, is that going to be economically viable? Is that the wise? You know, there's always these questions and they gave you permission to do it. And you went for it. The Art Institute of Chicago, the School of the Art Institute of Chicago, you chose that school in particular because it was a particular type of school. What was it about the, the education at the Art Institute? You spent five years there. What was it that the Art Institute of Chicago gave you or the School of the Art Institute gave you that was unique to that place? Mm -hmm. Well, one of the really unique things about the school is that it's actually attached to the museum. So uh, during some of my classes, we would just walk over. There's a back door from the studios into the museum that only people at the school can access. And so we could literally just walk into the museum if we wanted to go look at a piece for inspiration. Um, Yeah. Or if we, uh, you know, we would go often as a class to talk about a piece in, in art history. So that was really amazing. And then also Another unique thing about this school was that it was an interdisciplinary school. So that meant that I didn't have to choose a specific major. I could take courses in painting, ceramics, fibers, design, and it would still go towards my degree. So I wasn't boxed into a certain major within fine arts. Yeah. It's um, when you go, if you've been to the Art Institute of Chicago, there's a beautiful Georgia O'Keeffe as you walk out of one section to go down some stairs. There's a really large Georgia O'Keeffe cloud painting right there. And I didn't know this, but she went to the, the School of the Art Institute and she became a little bit of part of the influence for the way that you see color and see shape and things like that. Uh, I didn't know she was there. Did she have a, did you discover that after you were there or did you know her going in? I actually, I had gone to Chicago with my dad in high school and I went to the Art Institute and I saw her work there and I just, I loved it so much and I've always loved her since then. Um, Her use of color and also how she so closely investigates objects that people would just, you know, walk by. So think about her flower painting. She spends hours just looking at them and investigating them to paint them in the way that she did. And I just find that beautiful and incredible to dedicate your whole life to that. Yeah. If you're familiar with O'Keeffe's work, you'll see like a skull from the, she spent time in the New Mexico desert, I believe. Right. And, Mm-hmm. You'll see a skull and then a flower. And so there's realism in her work. She portrays things that are in the real environment, but she was an American modernist. In fact, I think the beginning, kind of the matriarch of the American modernist movement. And so her work has this really interesting blend of really vivid color, but an enhanced sense of uh, what is real. And I I didn't know it when we met. We met at First Watch, a little breakfast spot in Tampa. And I came to Mary Frances and I said, we want to develop a painting. We want to develop a piece of art, commission an artist to make visual and help us see through this idea of an enchanted world. And we drew from a particular text. There's a text in Colossians 1, 15 through 20. If you go home tonight, grab a Bible, read Colossians 1, 15 through 20. And in that, it talks about Christ is the center and by him and for him, all things were made and in him, all things hold together. And it talks about a visible and an invisible world. It's just this incredible, it's Paul's writing, just this magisterial description of what is real. And there's a vividness to it and aliveness to it. 
And that's not necessarily the way we in the modern era see our world. And yet somebody like O'Keefe does. She's able to see something and see the vividness and the aliveness in it. So when we sat down and we talked a little bit about influences, I didn't know that you were already uh, trained in that way of seeing both in a realism way, but in an abstract way or an enhanced way. We gave you three prompts. We gave you Colossians 1, that text. And we also gave Mary Francis a little quote from C.S. Lewis. He says that the world, the universe is actually dancing, tingling. It's a festival, not a cold machine. And so I wrote that down and said, I'm going to send you that in an email. Colossians 1, it's a festival, not a machine. And then just those two words, enchanted reality. Those were what we gave you and said, we're, we're hoping that somebody can take that and help us see those themes. How does something like that, the prosy side of that, go to the art artist and where does it go from there? Um, I actually love that you gave me those two prompts because they were so open-ended. And usually when you think of commission, someone comes to you and asks for something very specific. But this was so open-ended and you could give those same prompts to 10 different artists and they would make 10 completely different paintings. So uh, I was really excited about the opportunity when y'all came to me and I was really grateful for it. And it gave me a, I was, I was a little bit in a, in a rut with my artistic practice. I've been doing more graphic design and digital design work. So it really, after I created this painting, now I have all these ideas flowing. It's like it started a whole new collection that's building in my head. So that's been really exciting. Um, yeah. Yeah. It was, I was marveling because I didn't know, you know, how, not being somebody who paints or, you know, I've tried my hand at poetry, but I cannot paint. I can't make visual art. And I thought, what an open-ended prompt, like paint a picture of a visible and invisible world that's dancing, tingling, it's a festival. And really, the, the one thing that was interesting, and I can't wait to show you the piece, you're like, get to it already. Uh, <laughs> there's a frame in the piece. I said, I want somebody to walk by it. And when they walk by it, my hope is that they'll stop and say, what is that? And they'll be drawn into it. And you sent me just a picture. And then the morning after you sent the picture, I propped up my phone on the kitchen table and I was just looking at it as I had my coffee and my young son walked up and he, he walked right up to me and he said, good morning, dad, give me a kiss. And then his head went straight to the painting on the phone. And I said, what do you see? And he goes, it's really pretty. And I said, yeah, what else do you see? And he goes, I think I see heaven. I said, oh, okay. So <laughs> it already, for Jude, it drew him right in and he saw it drew him into it. So that was our hope. You approached it in that O'Keefe way with really vivid color. And so this is a bright piece. What was it that took you in that direction? Because originally you started with watercolor and in fact painted. I'll let you tell the story, but sure. take us from that idea became a watercolor work first, but then it, it evolved. It became something new. Mm -hmm. So initially, I, I always plan something in my head for a piece, but the end result ends up being totally different in the end um, than what I've pictured in my head, which is okay. I think that's really wonderful in many ways because you can try to plan something out. You know, it's kind of like life where you try to plan something out perfectly, but it never turns out how you perfectly plan it out in your head. Um, so I envisioned this large watercolor painting and I essentially made the whole painting and I stepped back away from it and I just thought this is not right. <laughs> I thought this is not right. This does not uh, portray the prompts that you had given me. One thing about watercolor paint is from far away, details get lost and it doesn't have, there's not a, a vibrancy to it like there is with other mediums because it is translucent. So um, once I decided, okay, this I'm just going to have to pivot and go a different direction, I ended up leaving some parts of the watercolor in the piece, but I started adding acrylic gouache, which is a... Uh, opaque water-based paint and then on top of that I added acrylic 
Yeah. You see that development. Early on, we, Mary Frances would send us some pictures, and it was true watercolor, and I got all excited about that. And then we started to talk about, I think I'm going to go into more colorful and bright colors. And so when I saw it, I was so glad you did, because that idea of dancing, tingling, a festival, I think you went the right direction. For me, it, it worked the direction that you went. So you chose to put a frame around the painting and then your hope was to pull us in with color and shape. What are some of the other elements that maybe somebody, when we unveil this, you, that they'll see or they'll notice? Yeah. Um, so you'll notice that there is the gouache is more of a flat matte paint, whereas the acrylics that I used were metallic acrylics. So there's a really interesting contrast between the two types of paint. And I had never put those together before until this piece. So that was really fun for me. Um, uh, and lots of vibrant colors. Um, and then there are some places where the watercolor still shows through. Yeah, I see yeah. I see some of those things. I can't wait for you to see it again. I'm going to get to it in a second. Before yeah. I do, <laughs> I got to go personal for you for a second. High high point as an artist in your life so far. Uh, take us to a high, high point, point where you just say, yes, I love what I do. I love who I'm called to be. Um, I don't know if I have a single point, but it's more so when I'm just in my zone creating and I feel really at peace with what I'm doing. So I could say there's many high points in that regard. Um, I'm very blessed in that I can totally get into my flow and not talk to anyone. Well, that sounds kind of bad, but yeah. not talk to anyone for a couple hours and just keep on painting away. Um, and it's like the time flies before I know it, it's been eight hours. Yeah. What do you say to the person who is even tonight in the room saying, I've, I've written something, but I'm kind of embarrassed by it. I've painted something, but I don't know if I'll put it up. But just having been through those high highs and I'm sure some low lows, what would you say to other artists, maybe a young person listening who's that young version of you or even just us in the room? What would you say about perseverance uh, and what it's taken you to just keep making art? I mean, to get to uh, something you feel proud of, you're gonna make a lot of things that maybe you feel like aren't your best work, uh, but it's, you'll look back and you'll see, oh, this was so important to my development and from everything that you make, I think you can learn something from. So even if you feel like it wasn't successful in your eyes, you're, you can still take something from it and grow from that. Yeah. I wonder if that's even, we first began this conversation back in May, if you can believe it. So May of 23, sat down at breakfast talking about festivals and <laughs> a dancing world, not a cold machine and Colossians one. That was back in May. And you've kind of taken this, the ideas developed and it grows and it grows and it grows. And then you finish it. How do you know when something's done? Um, that's a great question. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody tells you it's done. You're <laughs> you know, uh, there's never, as an artist, and a, a lot of artists feel this way, you always feel like you can do something better. So I never look at a piece and I'm like, okay, it's finished. I'm all done. I always feel like there's something more I could do, some way to enhance it. But you have to know when to... Uh, when to leave it alone and when to move on because if you keep going back to something you can end up you know you can end up doing too much so you have to know when to when to stop and say okay this this is done this needs to to get out there yeah i think that's true for all of us right perfection you just think like here i'm gonna keep going till i get this perfect you and the permission to be like there's other work there's other paintings, there's other books, there's other songs, there's other breakfasts. Like we get to add something and enjoy something and then we get to move on. It's beautiful. Well, we're, we're gonna take a look at this painting. Okay. As we unveil this, just a little art education from you as an artist, sure. not just for this piece, but as we go into the world, 
What is some coaching you would give us just about viewing art? I, I love uh, Frederick Beekner says the artist's job is to ask us to pay attention. And so as the viewer, somebody encountering art, the, the artist has taken the time to say, pay attention to something. What else would you say to us just to help us grow in our ability to enjoy art? Well, I can say from my own experience, I enjoy taking in how a painting makes me makes me feel my first response without trying to identify any part of it just instantly like how do I how do I feel when I look at this painting and uh, I think young kids do this really well yeah. uh, when I was when I was teaching they would have such great responses just based on how they felt felt in the moment when they saw a piece they weren't trying to specifically identify anything yet they just said oh that makes me happy and that's what that's what i would recommend when looking at art how does it how does it make you feel what does it evoke from you yeah so interesting even that right for us in a modern age to say how does that make you feel what a good question ruth haley barton wrote a book called uh, silence and solitude and she talks about a jar of river water and she said, if you go out in the Hillsborough River right now, take a mason jar, scoop it into the river, put a lid on it and shake it up and keep shaking it. When you look at that and somebody says, well, what's in the jar? I don't know, muddy water, right? But Ruth Haley Barton says, but if you set that thing down and leave it alone for like a minute, it'll start to separate. 10 minutes, half hour, 45 minutes, you'll come back. You can walk right up and say, there's gravel in there. There's plastic in there. It's a hockey puck. Who knows what's in there if you get it out of the Hillsborough <laughs> River. But you'll be able to make sense of it. And so often our life is the same way. It's just doing this all the time. And then you come to an art unveiling and somebody gives you the permission. So tonight may not even be about what we get to enjoy and celebrate, but it may just be the first time all week you've had the permission to sit there and go, what's in my jar? And I saw this bright, vivid thing based on a dancing, tingling world, a festival, not a cold machine. And I saw that thing and I felt something else. Artists ask us to pay attention. That's Beekner's words. I would just say something probably will happen to you tonight in the room as we look at a painting. That's the joy of it, right? So I think that's so, so good. We're going to unveil the piece. And here's how I think we'll do this. Mary Frances and I will get up. We'll both, I'll try to reach high and get as high as I can to <laughs> unbuckle that. I might ask for help, but we're going to get that, that drapery down. And when the drapery comes down, we'll just kind of stand there and let us just enjoy it. And here's how I would say, we're going to practice. We're going to do this four times this year. We've, we've commissioned an, an impressionist artist. We're talking to a very, very realist, somebody who paints like Caravaggio. So there's different art styles that we're gonna bring into this kind of a space. Tonight, I just want you to enjoy this piece and look at it and we'll ask a couple particular questions, but then we're gonna invite you to come up, eat that food, get a little bit more uh, mm -hmm. at the bar, and I'm gonna have a journal. And that journal is gonna be sitting right here and I would love for you to just come up and write down how you feel, what you saw, what you thought. And I've just titled the first page of that journal, just Mary Francis 118. I hope I got the date right. I never do. Uh, <laughs> 24. But I would love everybody in here, just before you slip out, come up and just take a second, be still, let that jar sit for a second, and then just write something down. And together, we will have had this moment that will be something we can revisit and it'll be a story that gets shared with your family, somebody else down the road. So should we do it? Let's yeah, see if I can reach absolutely. this. All right. And you titled, we talked about this, The Garden. So the piece is titled The Garden. That was high. Okay. You know, I need some it. help. <laughs> can you get it? I think we got it. We got it. Ready? I feel like we should stand, so I'm not in the way of it for sure, but you can see the metallic uh, coming off of that. Um, I don't want to talk about particular things because I just want us to enjoy kind of the color and the vividness. 
But I want to point out, you see the gold frame around it to look through something. Mary Frances, talk, just take us through some of the color choices that you made. Like, how do you come up with a palette like that that spans that many colors? Um, I don't pre-plan it. Uh, a lot of it, honestly, is intuitive. I've been painting for a long time, so you know... Uh, one thing that's important to know is that warm colors are going to feel like they are coming out at you, whereas cool colors, so think cool colors are your blues, your greens, they're going to feel like they're receding. So that was where I first started with the colors is, okay, I need to make the foreground stand out, so I'm going to make those warmer toned colors and then cool cooler toned colors for the receding mountains. But like I said, a lot of it is intuitive. And if I paint a color that I feel like isn't right, I just paint over it. <laughs> yeah. Structurally, this piece was a little bit different and it's not on canvas. Tell us just a little bit about the structure and then you made it dimensionally too. You, you made it a little bit thicker. Right. So this is a wood panel. And what I did is I adhered a large piece of 100% cotton watercolor paper onto the panel. I enlisted my dad to help me because I couldn't do it by myself, <laughs> which I'm grateful for because th the paper came in this huge roll and I had to very quickly put the the glue on and then the paper on and then I had to leave a bunch of books and weights on it so that the paper would fully adhere to the board and then I had to cut the edges of the paper and sand the panel so that you know the sides were flat um yeah, and one of the reasons why I did that is because if I painted directly onto the panel, um, it would have a very different effect. So what why I used watercolor paper is because it's because it's 100% cotton, the pigment is going to absorb into the paper, which creates a different effect from if you say, say I made the same painting on a canvas, it would look very different. Yeah. It's just amazing that May, at first watch, three prompts, Colossians 1, Enchanted Reality, and a, a dancing, tingling festival, not a machine, go. And then you build a wooden base, and on top of the wooden base, you put watercolor paper and sand these edges, and the whole process and development, and you start to see it in the first watercolor version. You look back and you go, that's not what I was seeing. So I'm going to add acrylic. I'm going to add the, what's the metallic wash? What's that again? So um, all of the paint is gouache. So all of the colored paint is gouache, whereas, or watercolor, whereas the metallic is acrylic. So when you're painting using different mediums, you have to think about how you're going to layer the paint. So your thinnest paint is going to go as the first layer and then you build on top of that. So my first layer was the watercolor and then I went in with the gouache and then the acrylic. Mm. It's amazing. I, I could ask a thousand questions. Here, here's what I think I want to invite us to do. Let's celebrate this, but let's you just have some time with it. So what we're going to do, clear some chairs out. We're going to celebrate one more time together. And then I want you to just go grab something to eat, something to drink, see each other, talk amongst yourselves about what you experience and what's in the jar. And I'm going to put that journal and I would just invite you, take that invitation to add, what, what did you see? What did you hear? What did you feel? What did you learn? Uh, it's an open prompt for you. So Mary Frances Fleming, thank you for saying yes. Thank you for the creativity and the courage and for leaning into even the discussion so that we can help understand. I would have had no idea that there's watercolor paper behind that even. So little stuff like that. It's so fun to in, enjoy a night with an artist. So would you say thank, thank you one more time, Mary Francis? Thank you.